there's an ancient philosopher named Epictetus. And I could not avoid reflecting on one of his statements. And it was, do not stand in my light. So a while ago, I had to pull Reverend John because I felt I was standing in his light. <laughs> Reverend John. Thank you, Dr. Freddie. I think we, we share the light, don't we, friends? Good morning, family. Welcome to all those who join us in consciousness by watching and listening on the World Wide Web. Some old family, they're not old, but the, the friendship is, are worshiping with us today. Natasha, welcome from Farin. Nice to have you. And anybody else here who hasn't been here for a little while, welcome home. Jeannie, where is she? She just come back and she's in the kitchen already. Let us welcome Jeannie. Who's, there she is. From three months in, in um, the Netherlands, and she come back without even a little twang. Welcome back. Oh, look wonderful. Welcome, welcome. Last Friday, a man known fondly as Papa to the more than 1,600 men incarcerated in the Tower Street Correctional Facility here in Kingston, Jamaica, walked through the forbidding gates of that institution, a free man. I, I have no idea what words of farewell or good wishes he exchanged with the mates for whom he had been a leader and an inspiration for many years. But I can imagine his elation as he stepped for the last time past the sign that declares, none shall escape. Papa was a, participa a participant in the very first course Reverend Michael Record and I conducted in November 2013. And as some of you may know, the course is titled Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life. And that is what he did with his time at the Adult Correctional Facility. Let me read you what this bright young man wrote as his life purpose in that class, and I quote, my life purpose is to be a light in Jamaica and in the world, using my skills and what I have learned during my time in prison to impart wisdom to others, unquote. From the very first class, it was apparent that Papa was a leader. He chose a candle from among a group of objects to represent a quality which he saw in himself. And when he was asked to explain, he said, and I quote, I have always been a light, but I have come to learn that I was lighting others down the wrong path. So you see, friends, you can't help being a light. But where are you lighting? And what direction are you leading people? I don't know all that he learned during his incarceration, but here is what he wrote that he learned in our class called the Dolical Evaluation at the end. Quote, I have learned to have self-control, to control my thinking and therefore control my doing. I have learned my purpose. I am going to be more focused on my goals. And at the end of his evaluation, he writes, quote, I want to thank you for helping me understand and know who I am and who I need to be. Enough love and blessings, unquote. So having discovered his life purpose in our class, Papa kept his eye single, that is, focused on his goal. Using his inner vision allowed him to see clearly through what you and I, and perhaps he, might consider the darkness of prison conditions. 
So my encouragement today, as I call my messages, has been titled, Your Inner Vision is Your Eyesight. Your Inner Vision is Your Eye, capital I, Sight. And it is dedicated to this outstanding young Jamaican who has changed his life by changing his thinking. He has promised to come and worship with us soon, and I will keep my eyes single, awaiting that visit with great pleasure. In Matthew 6, verse 22, we read that the beautiful Jesus said, and I quote, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be filled with light. But if thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee is darkness, how great is the darkness, Unquote. The gift of eyesight, you know, is in my opinion, one of the greatest wonders of the human body. If you just think about your optical structure with its intricate retinal system, the rods and cones, the adjustable lens designed specifically to allow the perception of colors and depth and shape in the world around us, it really is truly amazing. But friends, in this teaching known as the science of mind, we learn about the working of the mind. And we come to realize that there is an even more amazing faculty of sight. It is our inner sight, our inner vision, or if you prefer, our eye sight. If I asked everybody here this morning to carefully observe the spectacular Ponciana trees in our garden, and then to take a picture of them or paint a picture of them, the result would be dozens of different pictures with significant differences in detail. Some of you might take a picture of the, of the orange one that was in such full flight a few weeks ago, looking out towards the road. Some of you may take a picture of it looking towards the temple so you can see the temple through it. I know people like Carol Campbell who have an, uh, the artist's eye for detail may take a picture of one petal really close up and, and explore the detail of that and the, and the beauty of that tiny, tiny, perfect expression of God. But each of you would see it through different eyes and through your own unique consciousness. You would all have seen the same trees in the same garden, but each of you would view them through a different frame of reference. Am I right? I think so. We see and interpret our world through the lens of our consciousness. And our consciousness really consists of our belief system, our core values, the things that we really think and take to be true. And this is why someone who is unhappy invariably tends to see things that justify their unhappiness. The pessimist always sees discouraging signs, while the optimist looks at the same circumstances and sees the possibilities in them. Now Jesus says, if then I be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. This is an interesting statement by the master teacher because we know evil is not a thing of itself. Evil is not a power. So I want you to get this truth, if nothing else today. There is only one power. What is it? God. God. And it is entirely good. And I believe you will agree with me that there can be no power opposed to God. So friends, what Jesus was saying is that if your perception of life with all its potential goodness has been blurred or obscured by your fears, your negative habits, and negative thoughts, if your consciousness is based on the fact that the glass is half empty, if you have allowed yourself to buy into the race belief that life is hard and that love is only for the lucky and the strong, then your cynicism will color the picture you see and the whole body of your life's experience will reflect that negative perception. So when Jesus referred to evil, he was talking about the concealment of good. 
It is purely the absence of light. When we come to understand this, we begin to understand that anyone who is unloving or violent or even unjust is actually a person who is good but who has never learned that truth about themselves. Or maybe if they learned it, they have forgotten it. In a very real sense, we can change that person, at least as far as we are concerned. And to accomplish this, we must behold him or her with the single eye that sees only the good and the true in others. Silently salute the divinity in that person and watch him or her change in their dealings with you. I believe that if we expose that person to this kind of seeing, we will also be a strong influence for their actual change. There is a point that is amusingly made in a story that originated in the Far East, which I have Jamaicanized. I have shared it before, but like all good teaching stories, it bears repeating. The story is about a young man who was walking down a road in Miami, Florida, and spied a beautiful girl walking along the street in front of him. Typical Jamaican boy, he followed her for several blocks, musing on how the way she walked, her undulations reminded him of the hills and valleys of his beautiful homeland. And just as he was about to call to her, she wheeled about and demanded, why you are following me? <laughs> oh, you is from Jamrock too? I should have went now. For those who are not familiar with the Jamaican way of speaking, she said, why are you following me? And he responded, I should have known you were from Jamaica too. Not nearly as nice in standard English. A wire follow me for. Oh, you come from John Rock, I should have went no. Then he declared earnestly, You is the prettiest woman I ever seen in my whole life, and I have fallen madly in love with you at first sight. Marry me no? Do. <laughs> the girl said, Sure. You're not so beautiful yet. Just look behind you and you will see my younger sister who is 10 times more beautiful. Now she is Miss Jamaica material. So the amorous young man wheeled around and his gaze fell on as plain a girl as could be found in all of Jamaica. And plain girls are quite uncommon on the island, I assure you. <laughs> what mockery is this, he exclaimed. You're trying to make a idiot out of me. You lied to me. <laughs> so did you, she replied. If you were so madly in love with me, why you turn around? <laughs> Smart young miss. Are you guilty of this, my friends? Have you fallen in love with truth? And you boldly declare that God is the only presence and the only power in your life. But you turn around whenever someone says, look over there, there's something good happening over there. You, tur you turn around in fear that your finances won't hold out. You turn around in resistance to anyone whom you perceive to be a threat to your security or your position. And you turn around in dread over every challenge that looms before you. Sometimes I say to people, how many times does God have to hold you down and gag you with your good? You know, it, ha it happens over and over and over, and yet still we still keep looking back over our shoulder at where we're coming from. As part of my daily spiritual practice, I've been playing a little game with Carol Campbell's set of 12 postcards, which is called 12 Gates to Paradise. And they're available in our book room, as Dr. Freddie shared with you during the announcements. Every morning, I shuffle them like a deck of cards, but maybe two or three times, just shuffle them together without looking. And then I take the one on top as my guiding thought for the day. I may journal on it and then keep my eye single on that idea for the day. And the divine mind is really amazing. Yesterday morning, after I prayed for the success of our cruise yesterday evening, I shuffled the cards and I drew number five. The caption for which was, everything is possible. But 
this morning, it really blew me away because when I shuffled, what do you think I came up with? I came up with card number nine, the caption for which reads, holiness equals right discernment. And it depicts a single eye. The very theme that I have chosen to explore with you this morning in my encouragement. Isn't mind just amazing? I'm thinking about keep your eye single, and what do I draw? A single eye. So I'm working with this today. Let me read it to you. Holiness equals right discernment. Make sin and ignorance as unreal to your mind as matter and evil. Within each of us is the joyful song of the spirit. Let us choose to imagine life holy and omnipresent. As we focus on our highest self, our joy must come to pass sooner or later, effortlessly. The mountains don't groan and labor to be great, nor do we, because we are spirit. And the caption, the, the aff affirmation by Emma Curtis Hopkins is this. The spirit that I am is joyous and sings because spirit is joy. The spirit that I am is joyous and sings because spirit is joy. Can we say that together? The spirit that I am is joyous and sings because spirit is joy. Thank you, Carol. These are just wonderful. Friends, the Gospels give us several instances of how Jesus employed his single-eyed view of humanity to heal the sick. And isn't it wonderful this morning how Dr. Freddie said, I joyously give up and relinquish humanity to embrace my divinity. My words, but paraphrasing what he was, he was praying. So when Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, stretch forth thy hand, Jesus was using his spiritual eyesight to see the original perfection and to call it into outward expression as a healed limb. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could look at all the affairs of our lives and say, I see you as perfect, whole, and complete. Isn't that the truth? We can glean a great lesson from the master teacher then concerning the idea that all people are divine. The lesson is this. We can and must determine the level on which we are going to relate to our fellow spiritual beings. If we deal with others based on the appearances of how they seem to be functioning, then our relationship will be shaped and molded by that level of consciousness. If you are grumbling that you just can't trust workers these days, or you are constantly nattering with your friends about why people have to act that way, stop and consider this. That was your experience of that person. And your experience of that person was created by the fact that you were relating to them at that level of their consciousness and yours. You drew out of him or her what you perceived him or her to be. You could just as easily have drawn out their highest and best self, the noble divine self that is the truth about every single person. But you would, uh, you would have had to precondition the relationship or business transaction by seeing it with your inner sight, your eyesight. Years ago, I was doing a workshop uh, at, at, a, at a business place it was a whole week of, of training for a group. And one day we were discussing how this matter of perception and how we see what we want to see and then it reflects what we really believe about others. And this woman said, boy, John, you can say anything you like. I have a little girl, she's going to be 13 tomorrow and the picnic bad. She bad, she bad, she bad. She run with a gang of boys. She come in all hours of the night. The teacher says she bad. The guidance counselor at the school says she bad. Last night, the police brought her home and said she bad. The picture just bad. We don't know how we can say anything else. This is a mother talking about a 13-year-old child. 
I said to her, you're willing to try a little experiment with me? She said, anything, anything, because I can't take it. I said, tonight, when you get home, sit her down and say to her, the police bring you home last night and them say you're bad. We talk to the head teacher at the school, him say you're bad. The guidance counselor say you're bad. The very gang of boys that you're running around with say you're bad. But listen to me. I am your mama. I brought you into the world. I was the vessel through which goodness shaped you. And I am declaring you to be good and very good. But that's what God said about you. Silence in the classroom. I said, you're willing to try it? I said, just sit the picnic down and say, people say you're bad, but I am your mother. I brought you and I declare you to be good. She said, all right. I, I hardly slept. Couldn't wait for next morning's workshop. And the first thing we did after we, we gathered was I said, you have to share with me what happened. And she started to cry. I said, well, dry your tears and wipe up the sniffles and tell us what happened. She said it was, as, as she had told us, it was her daughter's 13th birthday. On the way home, she bought a little stuffed toy for her. She said, I haven't given her a present for years because she, me said she bad and bad picking up forget nothing, but beaten. For those who don't speak Jamaican, somebody translate for me. Bad children are to get nothing but thorough beatings. Okay. She said as she handed it to her, the little girl started to cry. And she said, what happened? What do you? And she said, she always wanted a teddy bear and she never had one. And that was the opening, and the mother said, she told her exactly what we had said in the class. Everybody says you're bad, but I am declaring you on your 13th birthday to be good and very good, as your heavenly father has decreed you. And she said, I could feel the change in our relationship, and the two of us just hugged up each other and cried. Friends, that's a true story about how you begin the healing in any relationship that you have. Declare it to be good, and very good, and stand and watch that become your experience in a very real and wonderful way. So here is your assignment. No, you might have been cruising last night, but you can't get off away from an assignment. Your dis assignment, should you decide to undertake it, is this week, before you venture into any kind of relationship or interaction with anyone, whether it be business meetings or work or um, taking children to summer school, whatever you may be doing this week. Before you do anything at home with your kids or on the street, I want you to affirm, and I'm quoting, I am established in spiritual unity with God and with all people. I am established in spiritual unity with God and with all people. Say that with me. I am established in spiritual unity with God and with all people. I express the divinity in me, together. I express the divinity in me, and I salute the divinity in everyone I meet. I salute the divinity in everyone I meet. So to your neighbor say, you are established in spiritual unity with God and with all people. I salute the divinity in you. Together, you are established in spiritual unity with God and with all people. I salute the divinity in you. You are established in spiritual unity with God and with all people. I salute the divinity in you. Namaste. The founder of our great teaching, Dr. Ernest Holmes, said, and I quote, there is hidden within the mind of man a divinity. There is incarnated in you and me that which is an incarnation of God. The divine sonship is not a projection of that which is unlike our nature. It is not a projection of the divine into the human. God cannot project himself outside of himself. God can only express himself within himself. Man is not an individual in God. Man, meaning man and woman, mankind, is an individualization of God. You are of God. There is no God beyond truth and no revelation higher than the realization 
of the divinity within us, unquote. Friends, we are called to see that good in all people. I believe that the reason that we are at a center of a spiritual living and that the reason for this church's existence is to teach people, whoever will have ears to hear, that they are divine, that they are good and very good, and that we are called to make that declaration for our island, for our people, and indeed for all the peoples of the world. Keep your eyes single on that truth, and you will find yourself expressing more understanding, more tolerance, greater trust, and deeper love for your fellow humans. And the wonderful news is, others will correspondingly express themselves on your level of consciousness. Our task is to keep our vision single-eyed to the truth of our divinity. Don't leave home without preparing yourself for the many human interactions you will have. You can tr turn the focused laser beam of your spiritual eyesight on the world, and this will ensure that nobody determines how you act or react. Set your intention to let your light shine and to think, speak, and act from the highest level of consciousness of which you are capable. And if you encounter any apparent hostility or resistance in anyone, utilize your eyesight to behold them, their true self, their divine self. Keep your eye single. Look only at what you wish to achieve and to experience. I behold that divinity in you. Namaste.